and Tom saw Tomas run off with his named Skull. Hey, said Tom, he sort of looked like... me. Did he? said the vendor of skulls. Enrique, shouted a small Indian boy seizing Henry Hank's skull. Enrique pelted down the hill. He looked like me, said Henry Hank. He did, said Mound Shroud. Quick, boy, see what they're up to. Hold on to your sweet craniums and get. The boys jumped, for at that very moment an explosion hit the streets below in the town, then another explosion and another. Fireworks! The boys took a last look in at the flowers, the graves, cookies, foods, skulls upon graves, miniature funerals with miniature bodies and coffins, at candles, crouched women, lonely boys, girls, men, then whirled and exploded down the hill toward the firecrackers. Into the plaza, Tom and Ralph and all the other costumed boys raced, panting. They jolted to a halt and danced about as a thousand miniature firecrackers banged around their shoes. The lights were on. Suddenly the shops were open. And Tomas and Jose Juan and Enrique were lighting and tossing the firecrackers with yells. Hey, Tom, from me, Tomas. Tom saw his own eyes glinting from the wild boy's face. Hey, Henry, this from Enrique, bang! J.J., this, bang, from Jose Juan. Oh, this is the best Halloween of all, said Tom. And it was. For never in all their wild travels had so much happened to be seen, smelled, touched. In every alley and door and window were mounds of sugar skulls with beautiful names. From every alley came the tap-tap of Death Watch beetle coffin makers nailing, hammering, tapping coffin lids like wooden drums in the night. On every corner were stacks of newspapers with pictures of the mayor and his body painted in like a skeleton, or the president and his body all bones, or the loveliest maiden dressed like a xylophone and death playing a tune on her musical ribs. Calavera, 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 the song drifted down the hill. See the politicians buried in the news, rest in peace beneath their names, such is fame. See the skeletons juggling, standing high on each other's shoulders, preaching sermons, wrestling, playing soccer, little runners, little jumpers, little skeletons that leap about and fall. Did you ever dream that death could be whittled down so very small? And the song was true. Wherever the boys looked were the miniature acrobats, trapeze performers, basketball players, priests, jugglers, tumblers, but all were skeletons hand to hand, bony shoulder to shoulder, and all small enough for you to carry in your fingers. And over there in a window was a whole microscopic jazz band with a skeleton trumpeter and a skeleton drummer and a skeleton playing a tuba no bigger than a soup spoon and a skeleton conductor with a bright cap on his head and a baton in his hand and tiny music pouring out of the tiny horns. Never before had the boys seen so many bones. Bones, laughed everyone. Oh, lovely bones. The song began to fade. Hold the dark holiday in your palms, bite it, swallow it, and survive. Come out the far black tunnel of El Día de Muerte and be glad, ah, so glad you are alive. Calavera, calavera. The newspapers, bordered in black, blew away in white funerals on the wind. The Mexican boys ran away up the hill to their families. Oh, strange, funny, strange whispered Tom. What? said Ralph at his elbow. Up in Illinois we've forgotten what it's all about. I mean the dead up in our town tonight. Heck, they're forgotten. Nobody remembers. Nobody cares. Nobody goes to sit and talk to them. Boy, that's lonely. It's really sad. But here, I shucks, it's both happy and sad. It's all firecrackers and skeleton toys down here in the plaza, and up in that graveyard now are all the Mexican dead folks with the families visiting and flowers and candles and singing and candy. I mean, it's almost like Thanksgiving, huh? And everyone sat down to dinner, but only half the people able to eat. But that's no mind, they're there.
It's like holding hands at a seance with your friends, but some of the friends gone. Oh, heck, Ralph. Yeah, said Ralph, nodding behind his mask. Heck. Look, oh, look, look there, said J.J. The boys looked. On top of a mound of white sugar skulls was one with the name Pipkin on it. Pipkin's sweet skull, but... Nowhere in all the explosions and dancing bones and flying skulls was there so much as one dust speck or whimper or shadow of Pip. They had grown so accustomed to Pip's leaping up in fantastic surprises, on the sides of Notre Dame or weighted down in gold sarcophagi, that they had expected him, like a jack-in-the-box, to pop from a mound of sugar skulls, flap sheets in their faces, cry dirges, but no. Suddenly, no Pip. No Pip at all. And maybe no Pip ever again. The boys shivered. A cold wind blew fog up from the lake. Chapter 19 Along the dark night street, around a corner, came a woman bearing over her shoulders twin scoops of mounded charcoals, burning. From these heaps of pink burning coals, firefly sparks scattered and blew in the wind. Where she passed on bare feet, she left a trail of little sparks which died. Without a word, shuffling, she went around another corner into an alley, gone. After her came a man carrying, on his head, lightly, lightly, a small coffin. It was a box made of plain white wood nailed shut. On the sides and top of the box were pinned cheap silver rosettes, handmade silk and paper flowers. Inside the box was... The boys stared as the funeral parade of two went by. Two, thought Tom. The man in the box, yes, and the... Thing inside the box. The man, his face solemn, balancing the coffin on top of his head, walked tall into the nearby church. Was, stuttered Tom, was that Pip again inside that box? What do you think, lad? asked Mound Shroud. I don't know, cried Tom. I only know I had enough. The night's been too long. I seen too much. I know everything. Gosh, everything. Yeah, said everyone, clustering close, shivering. And we've got to get home, don't we? What about Pipkin? Where is he? Is he alive or dead? Can we save him? Is he lost? Are we too late? What do we do? What? cried everyone, and the same questions flew and burst from their mouths and welled in their eyes. They all took hold of Mound Shroud as if to press the answer from him, yank it out his elbows. What do we do? To save Pipkin? One last thing. Look up in this tree. Dangling from the tree were a dozen Halloween piñatas, devils, ghosts, skulls, witches that swayed in the wind. Break your piñata, boys. Sticks were thrust in their hands. Strike. Yelling, they struck. The piñatas exploded. And from the skeleton piñata, a thousand small skeleton leaves fell in a shower. They swarmed on Tom. The wind blew skeletons, leaves, and Tom away. And from the mummy piñata fell hundreds of frail Egyptian mummies which rushed away into the sky, Ralph with them. And so each boy struck and cracked and let down small vinegar gnat dancing images of himself so that devils, witches, ghosts shrieked and seized, and all the boys and leaves went tumbling through the sky, with Mound Shroud laughing after. They ricocheted in the final alleys of the town. They banged and skipped like stones across the lake waters, to land rolling in a jumble of knees and elbows on a yet farther hill. They sat up. They found themselves in the middle of an abandoned graveyard with no people, no lights, only stones like immense wedding cakes frosted with old moonlight. And as they watched, Mound Shroud, landing light on his feet in a swift, quiet motion, bent. He reached for an iron rung in the earth. He pulled. With a shriek of hinges, a trapdoor in the earth gaped wide. The boys came to stand at the edge of the big hole. Cat! 
stuttered Tom. Catacombs? Catacombs. Mound Shroud pointed. Stairs led down into a dry dust earth. The boys swallowed hard. Is Pip down there? Go bring him up, boys. Is he alone down there? No. Things are with him. Things. Who goes first? Not me. Silence. Me, said Tom at last. He put his foot on the first step down. He sank into the earth. He took another step. Then suddenly he was gone. The others followed. They went down the steps in single file, and with each step down the dark got darker, and with each step down the silence grew more silent, and with each step down the night became deep as a well and very black indeed, and with each step down the shadows waited and seemed to lean from walls, and with each step down the strange things seemed to smile at them from the long cave which waited below. Bats seemed to be hanging clustered just over their heads, squeaking so high you could not hear them. Only dogs might hear, have hysterics, jump out of their skins and run off. With each step down, the town got farther away, and the earth and all the nice people of the earth, even the graveyard above, seemed far away. They felt lonely. They felt so alone they wanted to cry. For each step down was a billion miles lost from life and warm beds and good candlelight and mother's voices and father's pipe smoke and clearing his voice in the night, which made you feel good knowing he was there somewhere in the dark, alive and turning in his sleep and able to hit anything with his fists if it had to be hit. Each step down, and at last, at the bottom of the stairs, they peered into the long cave, the long hall. And all the people were there, and very quiet. They had been quiet for a long time. Some of them had been quiet for thirty years. Some had been silent for forty years. Some had been completely mum for seventy years. There they are, said Tom. The mummies, someone whispered. The mummies. A long line of them standing against the walls, fifty mummies standing against the right wall, fifty mummies standing against the left wall, and four mummies waiting at the far end in the dark, one hundred and four dry-as-dust mummies more alone than they, more lonely than they might ever feel in life, abandoned here, left below, far from dog barks and fireflies and the sweet singing of men and guitars in the night. Oh, boy, said Tom. All those poor people. I heard of them. What? Their folks couldn't pay the rent on their graves, so the grave digger dug up these people and put them down here. The earth is so dry it makes mummies out of them. And look, see how they're dressed. The boys looked and saw that some of the ancient people were dressed like farmers and some like peasant maids and some like businessmen in old dark suits, and one even like a bullfighter in his dusty suit of lights. But inside their suits they were all thin bones and skin and spiderweb and dust that shook down through their ribs if you sneezed and trembled them. What's that? What, what? S Everyone listened. They peered into the long vault. All the mummies looked back with empty eyes. All the mummies waited with empty hands. Someone was weeping at the far end of the long, dark hall. <coughs> Came the sound. Oh. Came the crying. <coughs> and the small voice wept. That's... Well, that's 